Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Quint, India's first digital live streaming business news service. I'm Neeraj Shah and you're watching Indian Open. Let's go straight to the headlines. Oil prices settle near a two-month high after US drilling activity fell to the lowest level since May. IMF Chief Economist Geeta Gopinath flags India's fiscal slippage risk, says the consolidated fiscal deficit remains high and that it needs to be fixed. India's bankruptcy board pushes lenders and resolution professionals to speed up the insolvency process and finds a resolution for the 12 large NP accounts at the earliest. Amongst mid-cap stocks, Prabhat Dairy sells its dairy business to Fred Giant Lactalis for 1,700 crore rupees on a slump sale basis. And in earnings, Asian Paints is expected to report a healthy third quarter driven by 12 to 15 percent volume growth in the domestic business. Well, let's take a look at the trade setup for the day. Firstly, the news flows surrounding the world. Um, Davos is on. IMF, uh, while the Davos meets is on, has cut the growth forecast for the world. They believe that the economic expansion that the world was in for the last few years is steadily losing momentum. And they warn that fresh trade tensions will spell more trouble for the world markets. Uh, this was the big talking point yesterday. IMF on India, IMF on the world. India will be the fastest growing economy for the next two years, but the world GDP growth likely to come off and that shouldn't be viewed as good news. Not that the equity markets are too perturbed with it. Uh, they're just a bit quiet in the session today, as was probably the case yesterday, because uh, aside of the headline numbers, the other markets work quite for India too. Today, the Asian screen is starting off slower. The SGX Nifty is indicating a start, which is marginally in the red. And the Dow futures yesterday were already about half a percent lower. I reckon they would be lower in the session today as well. So remember, the US markets were shut yesterday, but the Dow futures as they were trading were already showing their hand, which was a bit weak. Okay, what about the trade setup for the day and how did we do in the session yesterday? Well, it was uh, an interesting day of trade because while the Nifty looked good, the rest of the stocks did not. It was a very, very narrow market with four or five stocks leading the charge. And frankly, you know, if you had looked at the contributors list yesterday and if you had removed Reliance Industries, you would have seen that the Nifty would have been very, very flat. 44 points, 43 and a half points to the total 87 points contributed by Reliance Industries. Shave that out and you would have had a very flat day of trade. 45 points on the losing side, 43 points on the gaining side. That's the, that's the number that I'm looking forward to. Look at that. Out of the 93 points, 45 contributed by Reliance. Take that out and you knew what the markets would have looked like. Uh, VIX 2 has shot up uh, over the last few days and it's trading close to one month highs at about 18.15 and a big shoot up in trade yesterday. Keep that at the back of your mind. At around 20 odd levels is where uh, then VIX had retreated from the last time and indicated some bit of positiveness. Still some time away, but volatility is indeed shooting up. And the problem has been that the Nifty Bank has not been participating. It was up marginally in trade, but not really giving the support that the Nifty needs, despite HDFC Bank and Kotak Bank looking okay. Market breadth looking weak. Uh, there's absolute lack of participation. A lot of FNO indicator, FNO counters were looking very weak and short build up too. So it was not the most pleasant of market scenarios in trade yesterday. Uh, Brent has inched up higher too and that should not be viewed too well. Um, 62.57. I think uh, the US drilling numbers had shown a bit of a slowdown. The beautiful chart on Bloomberg which speaks, which shows about how that activity has come off and that may just lead uh, to believe that uh, the stockpiles in the near future will not be as high as was about a month ago and therefore some bit of upside uh, that came in for Brent crude in trade yesterday as well. We'll watch out for this and watch out for the oil impacted counters, the BPHP RCs of the world. But what is it that we should watch out for today during the day? Firstly, in terms of results, a lot of active counters coming out with numbers today. Firstly, on the Nifty, Asian Paints, watch out for this one. Very actively traded counter as well, important set of numbers to monitor. And then a lot of insurance names, by the way, HDFC Standard Life or HDFC Life Insurance as they call it now. ICSA Prudential coming out with numbers, Obera Realty, and will mark the first of the blue chip real estate names to come out with numbers. Very important set of numbers to monitor. 
Reliance Nippon Asset, Life Asset Management, RNAM would be important, TVS Motors will be important. I've included a small cap company, Sadna Nitro Chem, simply because it came out with a very interesting quarter the last time and had a big reaction. So watch out for Sadna Nitro Chem in the session today as well. Um, all of these numbers to monitor. However, what are the stocks that will react at 9.15 a.m.? Some results, some news, HDFC, AMC. I don't know which way the market will look at these numbers, whether uh, the market looks at uh, the performance which has been aided by lower expenses despite very low revenues and therefore punishes the stock or does the market believe that lower expenses due to the SEBI news or otherwise means that higher margins and higher profits and therefore reward the stock. Interesting one to monitor. Do watch out for HDFC AMC in the session today. Very important counter to look forward to. Prabhat Dairy, Lactalis has bought the dairy business for about 1700 crore rupees. The company has said that it will share substantial portion of the sale proceeds with the shareholders. The market would dearly love to believe this because it's not necessarily happened in the past with other companies. Let's wait and watch. The deal on the face of it looks positive. Much higher valuation than the current market cap or the current EV. Let's wait and watch what happens here. Zensar Tech, one more tech company mid-size, which has not come out with the best of numbers. Dollar revenues was up 4%, but margins contracted quite significantly. Net profit shrank 40%. There was another item the last quarter, but the fact that the margins have contracted so much would probably mean a bit of a trouble for the stock in the session today. We'll be talking to the management as well at 9.30, so do watch out for this one. Last but not the least, people anticipated NBFCs to come out with weak numbers. l &D Finance Holdings has come out with particularly decent quarter NII up 55% net profit up 80% again some extraordinaries here but the fact that NII is up 55% means that they've had a good quarter wouldn't be surprised if this one reacts positively despite a flat market start that we'll see so lots of stocks to watch out for in the session today particularly watching out for HDFC AMC and the reaction thereof however let's tell you what's lined up on first word today the collection of the top editorial stories that we want to bring to you Vodafone Idea dropped 10% in the last two trading sessions. Is the merged entity unable to keep up in the highly competitive environment? Samit Sarkar will join us with an analysis. A slump in cement pricing in the southern markets may hurt the industry's growth in the December quarter. Nikki Mirchandani gives us the earnings expectations as we kickstart the cement earnings today. Rakesh Junjunwala has made some notable changes to his portfolio in the last three months of 2018. Yatin Mota has put together the buys and the sells. And IMF has flagged off some risk to both the global and the Indian economies. We get your slice of an exclusive conversation with Geeta Gopinath. Start off with Vodafone Idea and Idea Cellular, which came together to create India's largest telecom operator. The plan was to build on the synergies and put up a fight with other heavyweights like Airtel and Rulanzio. But it hasn't quite gone as per plan. The stocks dropped more than 10% over the last two trading sessions alone. What's ailing the telecom operator? Samit Sarkar is here with an answer. Samit, I can think of a lot of answers, but to your analysis, what stands out? So there are main, mainly three concerns that has been ailing the share prices of Vodafone Idea recently. Now, firstly, if you see, it is the management commentary that has come in from Reliance Industries analyst meet. Now, in the analyst meet, Reliance Industries said that they are currently happy with the tariff structure and they have no plans to hike tariffs. Now, why is this important for Vodafone Idea? Currently, if you see in the telecom market, Reliance Geo is a price setter, and if Geo is not willing to increase it, uh, its uh, tariffs, it means that the pricing pressure will continue in the telecom market for the remaining period, which which is a big negative for Vodafone Idea because they are the ones who have been hit the most because of this tariff force that we have seen in the telecom market. Now, if you see their active subscribers, they have come down for the last, uh, for continuously for the last seven months. They have lost more than two crore subs active subscribers in the last seven months and their revenue market share, it has, that has also reduced to close to 32% from 42% in the first quarter of financial year 2018. So, if this pricing pressure continues in the telecom market, Vodafone Idea will be impacted the most. Now, second reason that has been ailing Vodafone idea is the planned fund infusion. Now, companies set to meet tomorrow to uh, decide to finalize the process of fundraising plans that the company has. Now, earlier they had said that they are planning to raise close to 25,000 crore rupees. Now, this has to be done uh, via rights issue. Now, such a fund, inf such a huge fund infusion done by Vodafone Idea would lead to an equity dilution of close to 45% co considering Vodafone Idea's yesterday uh, yesterday's closing price. So, this is a major overhang on the stock because it's a very huge 
huge equity dilution that is nearly 45 percent. Lastly, if you see this planned fund infusion that they are doing to pair debt, now that is actually not going to help the company much because if you see the company's total gross debt is close to 1,26,000 crore rupees, which means that FI 19 leverage that is gross debt to EBITDA is close to 28.6 times. Now, post this fund infusion of 25,000 crore rupees, the company's gross debt would come down to close to 1,1,000 crore rupees, but the leverage ratio would still remain high at close to 23 times. Now, they also have uh, plans to sell stake in Industars, which would give them close to 6,000 crore rupees, but still keep the leverage ratio upwards of 20 times. That is close to 21.6 times post this, uh, post this uh, stake sell in Industars. Now, the company is also planning on various, uh, has plans of various synergies that would come in financial year 21. Uh, FI21, that is close to around 8,400 crores of synergies that they are expecting in financial year 2021. Now, these synergies will still take two more years to come. And with such a high debt and a leverage and a, a high leverage ratio, the company would still need more fund infusion in the coming two years, which is a major overhang on the stock because that would lead to further equity dilution for Vodafone Idea. And that, these are the main reasons why the stock has been falling. It's firstly the geo's com commentary that has come in that there won't be any relief on the rising side and second is the uh, equity dilution that has been happening in Vodafone India because of the fund infusion that the company needs to do to pair that debt and lower the leverage ratio. Okay. Let's wait and watch. So pain points and doesn't seem like the pain is going away in a hurry, Samit. It's not. It's actually not because uh, many experts and many uh, analysts were expecting the pricing pressure to rationalize in the coming months. But with Geo's commentary of saying that we are not going to hike tariffs, this is not expected anytime soon. So that's going to remain a major overhang on Vodafone idea. Yeah, it's, uh, it's actually in a bit of a dock. Let's see if, uh, how much further. But yeah, <laughs> and that, that says it all, right? The call drop. It's a very apt a header being given to this chart of Vodafone idea as well. Samit, thanks for putting that into perspective. That's the reason why there's pain in Vodafone idea. As we always say, don't go out and buy a stock just because the stock is corrected. There could be multiple reasons why the stock could stay lower or even go further lower from the levels that it is at. Not saying that's true for Vodafone idea, but just cautioning against going out and buying because it's fallen so much. This, this, these levels must be 52 um, week lows or life lows for Vodafone idea, to be honest. Okay. Uh, let's move on to the next piece. Cement companies clock in a steady quarter in volumes in the December, uh, in the October, November, December period. But pricing power remains elusive in most parts of the country. Southern market was the worst hit and it's likely to result in an earnings decline for some of the southern players. Uh, the top three cement makers in the country, on the other hand, are expected to report a strong operational performance. Nikki Mirchandan is standing by with what the markets are pricing in from the sector as we get ready to kickstart the earnings today. Yeah, so this time around, Shree Cement will be uh, starting the earning season off for cement sector. Usually we had the Pan-Indian players, ACC, Ambuja, Ultratech, usually starting off this season. I'm going to quickly start with the volume growth figure that the industry is currently witnessing at. We're looking at a 10% on an average growth for December quarter across the industry. Pan-India players are expected to be in the range of around 8 to 10%. That for South is expected to be in the 9 to 10% kind of range. And for South base, uh, for North base players, that's expected to be higher by as much as 8 to 16 odd percent. Um, but then much of this growth is mainly on account of the kind of demand that has been witnessed in the month of October. November was a festive season for the sector, so there was, wasn't demand coming in enough. And December, uh, we saw elections happening for few states, so that that also weighed on the kind of volume impact that the industry would otherwise have witnessed. Uh, moving on to the price rise, which is an essential to know what kind of realization would these companies clocking for the December quarter. Well, price price momentum pretty much remains elusive. Look at the price trend there. Uh, Northern region has taken a hit. Southern season uh, region has given a 28% decline. Pretty evident cut out there in terms of YOY price cuts that we've seen for cement prices. However, we've been seeing a substantial amount of uptick coming in from central region probably one of the reason why we're seeing the likes of pan india players with massive exposure to that reason uh, to that region reporting healthy set of numbers coming in for december quarter uh, talking about the cost pressures right now they seem to be ebbing uh, for the industry as a whole pet coke prices have been reducing uh, they've reduced actually by 18 percent year on year basis for the for the quarter in the december which in turn will have some bearing or some positive impact of this would be felt in the quarter but then complete impact of this will be felt only in the Q4 for most of these cement companies on account of which we might just 
see a flattish growth trend or the EBITDA growth trend for most of these players. Uh, but then if you look at the performance, we're seeing a stark performance or a rather dismal performance coming in from these south-based companies which are witnessing low uh, cement prices. Uh, pretty much evident in the kind of EBITDA performance that we're expecting from Ramco, India Cement and Orient Cement. Uh, ACC Ambuja Ultratech on the other hand, I expected to, uh, expected to register EBITDA growth on your on your basis in the range of around 12 to 45 odd percent. So a good show continuing from Pan India basis players. But then Neeraj, what I'd like to highlight is the fact that if the uh, if the cement pricing uh, somehow returns to the industry by Q4, we're lo looking at good volume growth. Cost pressures are now ebbing. So the only key uh, behind uh, a good performance coming in from the sector as a whole will be just the pricing power. If these companies manage to uh, to hike the prices of the product, which looks a little difficult going forward in quarter four because we'd see some kind of volume push coming in by these players. But then if that somehow is sustained or high, then it's going to be a different ball game for cement sector as a whole. Okay, Nikki, thanks for putting that into perspective. Well, that's uh, the cement companies and let's see how they behave in the session today. Uh, let's talk about a couple of other opinions. Firstly, IMF has reduced its global economic growth forecast, citing emerging risks like trade tensions and a no-deal Brexit. Minka Doshi caught up with the chief economist Geeta Gopinath in Davos to get IMF's prescription to counter this slowdown and what they make of the Indian economy ahead of the upcoming elections. Listen in. We've, re we've reduced the forecast for 2019, uh, but it's important to note that the revisions are modest. Uh, and it's being driven in advanced economies. It is being driven by a slowing of growth in the euro area. Within the euro area, it would be Germany and Italy. So that's what it looks like uh, for uh, the advanced economies. What we are more concerned about mm -hmm. are the growing risks to the global economy. Uh, and there are several of those. Some of the important ones are an escalation in trade tensions, a worsening in financial conditions, uh, no deal Brexit, uh, and uh, in the event of a faster than expected slowdown in China, the consequences of that for the global economy would be far more negative than what we have right now. Okay, my next question is a two-part question. Do you believe there is um, enough room, both from a monetary policy point of view as well as from a fiscal stimulus point of view, to counter uh, some of the slowdown that you're referring to? That's one. And the second is you've also focused on the impact on financial markets. You've said a range of catalyzing events in key systemic economies could spark a broader deterioration in investor sentiment. What is it that you're expecting? Uh, policy space is indeed uh, limited. It is varied across different countries. Uh, there are some countries for which there is abundant policy space, but there are others for which policy space is quite um, tight. Monetary policy has barely normalized in many of the yeah. countries of the world, and so that is a concern. Uh, what we are uh, recommending is that given that growth, while has slowed, is not decline precipitously, we still think that there is some more time left for certain countries to build up buffers, uh, fiscal buffers, uh, and uh, so that in the eventuality that there would be a downturn next time around, that they would be better prepared. Okay, and the financial market impact? The financial market impact is a big one. Uh, for much of 2018, while the trade tensions were ongoing, uh, it appeared that advanced country financial markets were disconnected from the trade tensions. But recently what's happened post-October is that those two have come together. They become more intertwined. And the risks to, of that are high. Uh, and why is that? It's because we are uh, living at a time when debt, both in the private sector and in the public sector for many countries, is quite high. Yeah. So you've spoken of sovereign yields. You've spoken of corporate bonds in the U.S. What are you watching very, very closely uh, in 2019? Uh, we watch many, many, uh, many different indicators. Uh, we certainly watch what's happening closely in the financial markets in terms of sovereign spreads, uh, in terms of corporate borrowing costs, in terms of market sentiment. There's also been a change in financial market sentiment in terms of uh, a more pessimism about corporate earnings. Uh, a lot of this is going to depend on what happens with the trade uncertainty, with Brexit uncertainty. Uh, so these have to be resolved. Okay. One final question on India. Uh, we're in an election year. The fiscal situ situation is looking a little tough. Do you think India has room for 
a substantial farm benefit situation. I don't know what to call it. I'm not sure it's a loan waiver. Uh, we're not sure it's going to take some form of a direct benefit scheme or a UBI that people have discussed. Um, what are you looking forward to? Um, oh, we don't speak directly to kind of individual policies that, uh, that countries should follow. Uh, but in the case of India, what uh, we flag is the fact that the overall consolidated de fiscal deficit uh, remains high, and it's been the case for the last five years. So we certainly need to fix that. We need to address that. Uh, GST revenues have not come in at the rate at which it was expected, and so that would be a con an area for continu continued improvement. Well, that's all that we have on First Word today. Remember, a bunch of stocks are likely to react uh, in today's session on the numbers or otherwise, as I said, uh, HDFC, MC, Prabhat, Daily and a few others. What we'll try and do is come back from this break uh, and focus entirely on the day's trade in moments from now. Of course, at 9.15 later on, we'll discuss markets and macros with Mihir Vora of Max Life Insurance. We decode the December quarter earnings of Zensar Tech with Sandeep Kishore. Uh, the MD and CEO of the company, and Dinanath Dubashi of LNT Finance Holdings speaks about the strong quarter that they have had. But after this break, a full tilt towards the day's trade. One way to do that is to collect and celebrate the life lessons of those people. Deepak Ramola, the man behind Project Fuel. Fuel stands for Forward the Understanding of Every Life Lesson. His audacious mission is to immortalize the wisdom of as many people as possible. One thing I was absolutely sure about, I don't want it to be a quote on the wall. I want people to experience so the experiential part is where we use different tools and mechanisms to create one act, and the act is of making lives count. Watch his exceptional story, pursued by Skoda, only on Bloomberg Quinn. हकीकत में गुड एंड सिंपल टैक्स है द फाइव हंड्रेड रुपी एंड थाउजेंड रुपी करेंसी नोट विल नो लॉन्गर बी लीगल टेंडर फ्रॉम मिड नाइट ऑन रोड Anything and everything about your investments. We're just a touch away. Monday to Friday at 12.30 p.m. Only on Bloomberg Quint. Hello and welcome. You're watching Indian Open right here on Bloomberg Quint. Um, it's going to be interesting now. Yesterday we saw Neeraj, the markets pulled up and it was actually a very interesting dichotomy between the large caps and the mid caps. And like we, we, we sort of broke it down yesterday, it was primarily because of your larger names, Reliance Industries and we saw the breakdown of uh, you know, the point contribution yesterday and out of 80 points on the advances, uh, 45 points was Reliance Industries. So it was on the back of Reliance Industries and HDFC Bank that the Nifty actually landed up doing what it was doing. Yeah. Entirely, and the market weather was terrible. It ended at the worst day's lowest point, so the contribution was lacking with the markets looking very soft. Mid cap indices were down 1%, and yeah. the Nifty was up half a percent. So, yeah. and if you remove that uh, 45 point contribution of Reliance, Nifty would have probably been just flat. Yeah, and, and, and the Nifty Bank is not supporting, so let's wait and watch what 
comes up IT in the session keeps, today. IT keeps surprising actually. Yesterday yeah. was yet another day where we, we saw IT, uh, you know, the interest was not just amongst the large cap names. Wipro, yeah, because of the guidance cut, that was a little bit of a sore spot. But uh, across the board, even in the mid cap space, uh, you had the likes of your first source, a smaller name like Tech Solutions, uh, KPIT Tech, NIIT Tech, all of these names were up and about in yesterday's session. Yeah, let's see if they continue the mojo in the session today. Mm, yeah, and we'll get our experts to talk about all of that and more in uh, today's trade. But uh, before we move on, uh, let's talk a little bit more about uh, what's happening in the future is an option space but that will come in a bit let's talk about the liquidity crisis which may be over but the pain will linger for some time to come says Sanjeev Bajaj the managing director of Bajaj FinServe lenders need to assess the risk better speaking to Menka Doshi on the icy slopes of Davos he says the regulator also needs to ensure that the stress doesn't spread beyond a point in India, I think the uh, liquidity squeeze that affected some NBFCs and HFCs is behind us now. Okay. Um, Judge Finance has been okay because we follow very okay. prudent practices. But um, the bigger question is to understand why this happened. If it was because of company A or B that could very easily have been addressed um, instead of making this a much larger industry issue, which it wasn't. And that's something that the regulator needs to think about, how to prevent something like this from recurring. Okay, so that's specifically what I wanted to talk to you about, you know. I think the asset liability mismatch, uh, the sort of the limited sources of funding, especially wholesale funding that the NBFC industry has witnessed, uh, you know, over its sort of three, four, five years of explosive growth. What in that model specifically needs to change if that growth were to return, maybe at a moderated pace and to sustain? I would say four things. One, risk needs to be priced better. We are going through a period where the public sector banks are not able to lend. Mm -hmm. They are going through their own challenges. Hence, a lo lot of liquidity went into NBFCs, especially even younger, newer NBFCs. Flushed with this min money, they started lending at rates uh, which didn't really match the risks that they were taking. And it's not just the risk to the customer that you're lending. It's a risk of learning that comes from spending years going through the lending cycle. Sure. So to me that's one. The second is in terms of asset liability matching. Uh, very clearly for any NBFC or for any bank, uh, the closer you match your assets to your liabilities, the less is the chance of getting caught in a liquidity squeeze. And a few HFCs were not, and uh, I think they got caught out over there. Third important thing is, in general, liquidity availability to banks. Uh, we need to see to the larger NBFCs. If you look at the top 10 NBFCs today, each one of them is 10,000 crores assets and above. Bajaj Finance is over 100,000 crores in assets. We are bigger than most banks. Um, it is important to sit down and rather than to think of whether this is an NBFC or a bank license, to try to think about how do you structurally make these 10, 12, 15 NBFCs, not the remaining 7,000, but these 20 of them stronger, because they are playing a significant role in the economy, but naturally they are systemically big now. Hmm. So that needs to be taken care of. And to me the last major issue over here is why wasn't there a run on the banks uh, four months ago? Hmm. Because there is a certain um, understanding that the banks will always get protected by the RBI. I think a similar understanding is to be there for these big NBFCs. Now, what it means, what the details are, those things need to be worked out. All right, that's a prominent voice coming in from Davos, but do stay tuned to Bloomberg Quint because there will be lots more coming from Davos in terms of special voices. Moving back to the markets then, let's take a look at the derivative space. And Agam Vakil, he is standing by with a quick FNO wrap out of what happened in yesterday's session and how we are set up for today. Agam, good morning. Good morning. Well, uh, we've seen uh, some increase in when it comes to open interest starting off the nifty futures. Let's pull that up and take a look. About 4% added in open interest towards longs. It's, the picture isn't uh, very different for the nifty banking futures. A 2% added there as well. The India week surprisingly has risen quite substantially by as much as 9%. Two around 8 
18.2. Uh, for some concerns starting to come when, with respect to expectation of volatility come ahead. But uh, you know, moving on to your open interest distribution, look at the number of uh, well. You know uh, the puts that strikes that we have with respect to an increase in OI. At this point, we have considerable support at 10,700, 800, and 900 based on your accumulation in open interest and puts. On the uh, higher end, it is essentially the 11,000 mark that stands out in trade. But uh, moving on to changes too, you know, as one might expect, a lot more writing coming along the 10,900, 11,000 puts too. But uh, when it comes to your, uh, you know. Of stocks, Adani Power and Jet Airways are in, are in the FNO band. They continue to be. Uh, we have seen your Nifty put call ratio rise to around 1.59. It's the same for the Nifty banking put call ratio at around 1.18. And in terms of stocks, I'm watching out for DCV Bank. Some weakness coming in, but considerable weakness coming in. Union Bank, Vodafone, and Jubilant Food Works. All of them seeing fresh shots. And in terms of unwinding, well, perhaps just one or two stocks standing out in trade, considering something like a Torrent Pharma, Oracle Financial Services, and Syndicate Bank looking at a longs unwinding coming through. Another mixed year of trade, but uh, we're going to have to wait and watch as to how well, indices play out in, as we move into trade today. All right, Agam, thanks very much uh, for that. That is a quick uh, uh, wrap out on the derivative space. Neeraj, the other uh, stock that we are going to be watching out for is Prabhat Dairy and how that stock reacts to the news today of, of, of the sale of its dairy business and its uh, subsidiary as well. Yeah. And uh, uh, the value which has happened, 1,700 crores, about 1 1.2 times of its FY18 revenues. So uh, it's interesting to see how that stock plays out in trade today. Yeah, so I mean, I was just doing some basic number math and mm. you, you never know which way it shapes up, but 800 crores of or 900 crores of market cap, some bit of debt, but Ignore the debt. Yeah, but even if you ignore the debt, uh, because yeah. it's on a slump sale basis and liabilities get transferred, 800 crore or 900 crores of market cap, 700 crores worth of deal value. Mm -hmm. uh, there'll be some transaction tax and expenses that will be deducted from this. And well, the management has said that this is about 98 percent or 97 yep. percent of the business. Yeah. Yeah. The management has said that they will want to reward shareholders handsomely. Yep, that's it. That's going to be a kick out. Yeah, one is just hoping that uh, that. It turns about to be true because a lot of times in the past, and I'm not alleging that what has happened in the past should hold true for mm. Vivek Nirmal and Prabhat Dairy as well. A lot of times in the past, even after statements like these, select managements haven't quite gone ahead and rewarded and shareholders handsomely. Yeah, delivered. That's the yeah. point. Yeah, and then uh, the minority shareholders are help, held holding the holding the bag. Uh, I hope that it doesn't happen in Prabhat Dairy's case yeah. right now. They've given enough uh, enough assurances in their statement that the shareholders will be rewarded. Mm -hmm. Um, the deal value is reasonably attractive compared yeah. to the current yeah. market, market cap. cap. Right, right. So should ideally react positively. Uh, Quarter one of FI20, I think, is when the deal yes. concludes. I think they're also going to be looking at mandatory approvals in the meantime to see that this flows by smoothly. Uh, the stock price, though, should pull up a Prabhat Dairy to see what it did in yesterday's session. About a percent and a half. I think, yeah, percent. But, so you know, the interesting dairy. bit also about Divina, this is that uh, what what does this mean for the remaining dairy players as well? Because here is a management which about a year and a half ago mm -hmm. was confidently saying that we are in a growth sector. And the business is, is doing well. Business yeah. is doing well. We are in a growth sector. It will continue to grow 15, 20 percent. And they are ready to sell off the entire business on a slump sale basis. And they are, these guys are not newbies. They have been around in the business yeah. for a while. Yeah. Um, is it becoming a difficult business to manage with the political interventions as well that are happening in Dehri? Uh, that remains to be seen. Yeah, nonetheless, they've said they're going to remain attached to the business for at least two years. I mean, but that uh, bears no consequence as of now. Precisely. Uh, we'll see how the stock actually opens up for trade. That's going to be an interesting play to watch. But uh, let's also get in some other stocks in news. We've got some numbers to watch out for, HDFC AMC numbers, and how that plays out in trade as we open up this morning, uh, and a whole host of other stocks to talk about. So we've got Samit, Nikki, and Agam joining in. Um, starting off with you, I'm assuming uh, stocks in news, Nikki? Yeah, so a couple of them. Uh, I'm going to start off with, we are actually, we, we can keep an eye out on uh, public sector banks and ILFL select group companies, given that there's going to be a meeting which is going to be uh, held today with corporate affairs top uh, 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 officials along with that of senior, uh, senior bankers to discuss 
key issues which are related to the aftermath of ILN FS crisis, which leads to a fear that there could be fresh pile of a bad loan. So that's one counter that we like to keep an eye out on. Apart from that, we're looking at Prabha Dairy, where uh, the company is going to be selling its milk a process business uh, uh, for a consideration of around 1,700 crore. Uh, it's a subsidiary that the company would be selling to a French group, Indian Arm uh, Thirumala Milk Products, and the sale is expected to be completed by the first quarter of FY20. Apart from that, we're also looking at IDBI Bank, where the board has approved to reinitiate the divestment process of the bank in IDBI Federal Insurance. Now, remember that the stock has been declining past two to three odd session in trade. Apart from that, we'd be looking you for movies that NCLT has dismissed an amalgamation scheme of the company with a Cube Cinemax, and apart from that, three entities. And also, there is one more uh, financial stock or banking stock in focus, Dana Bank, or where a Times of India report suggests that the bank is looking to sell 14 prime properties for a consideration of around 540 crore, a small amount, but then the move is expected to free up capital and clean up its books. All right, Nikki, thanks a lot for that. We're going to watch out for all of those names. Some earnings, Agam? Yes, so uh, we're starting off with HDFC EMC, uh, with perhaps the big uh, mid cap that we are tracking. We've seen the revenues rise a subdued 2%, but profits rose as much as 25%, largely on account of lower expenses. And the base quarter, of course, also had a higher amount, rather, uh, th this particular quarter, or with respect to uh, your other income, which has moved up as much as two times. Uh, and its total AUM has also, well, grown 12% year on year. Moving on to Zensar te Technologies, again, a mixed quarter are coming through considering strength in revenue, sequential growth seven, by, by as much as 7%. But we've seen margins contract to around 8.3% against 10.4%. Uh, and uh, this is largely an account of higher subcontracting charges as well as rising people's costs, which has dented margins. But And profits are down by as much as 41% because of the fact that we've seen also a higher base owing to higher other income in the base quarter. Just Dial, again, was well, steady earnings coming through, revenues rising 15%, margins steady at around 24.3% against 23.6%, and profits rose two times, uh, so a well strength uh, remains and sustains as far as Josh Jal goes. Okay, you got to watch out for all of those names and the reaction to them. Some brokerage calls this morning, Saman? Well, a couple of them. First one is on Nestle, where Macquarie has initiated coverage with an outperform rating and a target price of 12,994 rupees. Now, according to the brokerage, Nestle is the best way to play the packaged goods space, is, uh, says Macquarie. Now, for each segment, if you see, Macquarie says that milk products and nutrition business will remain as a main mode for the company, along with that, the beverage and chocolate space will grow, uh, will, the growth will see on a, will be on a fast track, says the brokerage. And for its key brand, that is Maggi, a brand extension and higher penetration would drive growth for this product, says the brokerage. Now, according to the brokerage, market share wins in core categories would lead to strong volume growth for Nestle going forward. Lastly, it says that premium valuations of Nestle would sustain on the back of a strong earnings growth and a strong return on equity. The second we have is on Ashok Leland, where CLSA has maintained its sell rating on the stock, but has cut down the target price to 75 rupees from 85. Now, the brokerage says that the truck industry is likely to enter a downturn after five years of upcycle. Now, along with this, the new axle load norms is also hurting the CV industry, says the brokerage. And the competition is also looking to intensify with this downturn coming in in this commercial vehicle space. Now, given these negatives, the brokerage says that the valuations are expensive for Ashok Leland. And that's the reason they have maintained the sell rating on the stock. Okay, got that. And Ashok Leland, in fact, was trading near its 52-week low. Uh, in yesterday's session. Thanks everybody for joining in. Mayuresh Joshi is joining in as well uh, right now to discuss his views uh, with us. Mayuresh, good morning to you. Let's start off first with some earnings and what did you make out of the numbers that came out of HDFC, AMC and also Zensar Technologies. Like we highlighted, slightly more mixed bag while the revenues were positive. There was some amount of margin compression which could cause concern. Morning, Devina. No, largely, again, if you talk about the HDFC AMC numbers, I think the revenue was more or less in line with estimates. Uh, the expected AUM growth at 12% uh, is a very good indication and sign that the flows into equity markets are continuing. And that itself is an encouraging sign for the AMC players as well. The third element, obviously, is uh, how the overall earnings is expected to pan out. Now, with operating expenses under control, uh, what you've probably seen in terms of bottom line growth is very, very evident. Uh, 
And a large element of this part of the business is that uh, a lot of expenses get front loaded. Uh, so as the leverage starts coming through with AUM growth uh, and income probably compounding at a good pace, uh, I think the bottom line reflects uh, a very steady earnings momentum as well. I think valuations is something that one can probably look at specifically considering uh, what, what it probably trades at even from an FI20 perspective. Uh, for Zensar Technologies, uh, I think it was a mixed bag. Uh, what probably you saw in terms of margin contraction was because of higher subcontracting expenses uh, and again lower utilization levels which clearly played out. Uh, so again, it's a mixed bag. Uh, so I think uh, it's going to be a very, very stock specific approach in my opinion when it comes to the mid-cap IT space. But you reckon Zensar, but uh, did, did the margin contraction in Zensar disappoint you and would you believe that there is a higher probability of some downticks coming into Zensar relative to the other players or even in absolute basis. Morning, Neeraj. No, again, I think if you probably look at uh, the overall EBIT profile uh, for a whole host of IT companies, I think they have probably got uh, the same headwinds. Uh, you probably got lower utilization levels, you've got the cross-currency headwinds which probably hit them this time around and higher subcontracting costs. So even in terms of the on-site offshore mix, uh, I think that is a determining factor in terms of how margins are expected to pan out. Uh, so I think a whole host of companies have maintained their EBIT margin guidance uh, at this point of time. So yes, EBIT margins uh, was a little bit on the softer and subdued side at this point of time. But I think the overall positioning of IT companies, uh, specifically in terms of their product stroke services, the diversification that they've probably got within the different sub-segments that they cater to, and the large element in terms of execution specifically with digital investments actually having taken a core over the last few weeks and quarters, I think that really should be taken into consideration. So there might be a subdued reaction, but again, I think I'll be very, very watchful within the mid-cap IT space. Mm. Okay. Um, the, the news on Prabhat Dairi Mayuresh, what did you make of it? So again, I think it's very difficult to comprehend if you're probably selling off 98% or in terms of your core business uh, which contributes to the top line. I'm really not making uh, able to make sense uh, on what they're probably going to do in terms of investments uh, even if that proceeds does come through. So I think I'm really not too sure uh, in, in terms of uh, what, what this strategy has been from the management. But you were not taking a, a, a buy call or anything on Prabhat Dairy as a result of this transaction or if you have views on any other dairy company which you like? Because so one really needs to understand the perspective Neeraj at this point of time. I think uh, what they're probably structured and the expectations in terms of the business outlook for the sector as a whole. Uh, you've probably seen uh, subdued uh, reactions in terms of how earnings have panned out and that's very very reflective in terms of how the price movement has been not just for Prabhat but for its peers as well. Uh, now what really probably happens going forward is uh, the positioning of all these different players uh, and though I think a lot of these players have uh, positioned themselves in terms of value added products where the margins are relatively better and higher, I think it's going to be tense competition pressures coming through because a lot of players are probably getting into the same arena. Now what you're probably seeing even in terms of milk prices expected to go up, I think the input costs are probably going to improve. Uh, uh, for for uh, all these dairy makers as well. What happens in terms of realizations obviously is a pass through for them. But again, I think uh, value added products and the demand scenario and what probably happens in terms of competition intensity, I mean, I'm not too comfortable at this point of time with this sector. Okay, um, I believe some news that has come in and we'll be flashing it on the screen as well, but this should be important. Uh, let me just try and pull it out and read out the exact piece of news. It's on Sun Pharma and arguably has to do with uh, an announcement regarding the merger of Aditya Medisales, if I heard it correctly. But let's wait and watch and see uh, what comes out. Um, this should be an important piece of news for Sun Pharma. So just stick with that. Um, keep in mind, both the stocks went up in the session yesterday. Sun Pharma was about a couple of percentage points and Sun Pharma Advanced Research was up about 17% in trade yesterday. So big moves for both of those stocks in trade yesterday. Let's just see the announcement and the nature of the announcement before talking much about it or before even ask, asking Mayuresh Joshi about it. But this should be interesting. In a bit, Darshan will of course join in to throw some more perspective on this. But I think, yeah, that's probably the news that Aditya Medi Sales is going to be merged with Sun Pharma. A lot of questions about this were raised in the story that Bloomberg Quint had filed um, about a month ago. 
and then this recent spate of news flows questioning the relationship between Aditya Medi Sales and Sun Pharma had taken center stage as a result of which, of course, the stock came off so much. Okay, Bloomberg has put out this news that local distribution business to be transitioned into company unit. So, yep, this is the merger of Aditya Medi Sales into Sun Pharma. Which is something that the management had not probably indicated, but they had said that they'll take the necessary steps uh, required to soothe the, you know, the frayed nerves of investors. If there are questions regarding Aditya Medi Sales, they're going to take the appropriate route to make sure uh, that it does not go down too badly uh, with shareholders. So probably that's uh, what it has come down to. And it's uh, the merger of Aditya Medi Sales with Sun Pharma. Let's see the reaction because it's, it's too much of a flack that Sun Pharma got as soon as the first uh, whistleblower report came out and then the second whistleblower report just a few days ago, uh, you know, uh, hi uh, highlighting some um, some sketchy details and, um, you know, like the author of, uh, like the person who had the report, uh, Debussy's Basu, who spoke to us, said that there are some explosive things on the report which uh, he, he's going to be handing it over to Sebi to take a look at for further detailing yeah. but well, you look at this as the ways from Sun Pharma to now try and damage control they are yeah. appointing new auditors uh, the local distribution business to be merged with the company uh, so that's moving very quickly they're going to settle liabilities towards Atlas Global as well so a bunch of moves being announced right now while we get in some expert opinion as well let's just first get in an initial thought from Mayuresh Joshi because frankly now this this piece of news takes center stage Mayuresh your initial reaction to this, the big news, of course, is likely that, uh, I mean, Bloomberg is saying local unit, I would presume it's Aditya Medi Sales, that they're going to merge Aditya Medi Sales with itself, and maybe new auditors for the subsidiary companies as well. What are your thoughts? No, not preempting anything at this point of time, Neeraj. So I think let there be absolute clarity in terms of uh, what the management has to say on all the issues that have probably got raised. Uh, and then let's probably see in terms of what kind of an impact does that have in terms of their standalone as well as their consolidated numbers. Uh, so I'm not preempting anything at this point of view. Okay, let's not preempt. Fair call. I'll just read out the exact piece of news as well. Right here, domestic formulations business uh, distribution to be transitioned into Sun Pharma's wholly owned subsidiary. The distribution related to India's domestic formulations a business shall be transitioned from Aditya Medi Sales, the current distributor, to wholly owned subsidiary of Sun Pharma. So, no preempting uh, Mayuresh now. This is official. Aditya Medi Sales will be transitioned into Sun Pharma. This is official now. Made effective from Q1 FY20. Now, would you want to share an opinion? No, I think my, my my reaction probably still remains the same. Yes, it might have uh, got flashed in terms of the notice that has probably come out on the exchange. Uh, but again, I think there are over the overhang uh, factors that still will play trant in terms of how the stock might react. Uh, so there might be some amount of a positive bump up based on what they probably do in terms of damage control, as you rightly pointed out. Uh, but the larger picture probably still remains uh, on how they're able to access uh, all the other issues uh, in, in fact address all the other issues that have probably been raised by, by shareholders and the exchanges. So I think my reaction probably remains the same. Let's wait and watch. All right. Um, let's get in Darshan who's been tracking the story very closely. Darshan, what have you been picking up? Yeah, so basically the uh, exchange filing is out. Uh, uh, a lot of uh, things was said about Sun Pharma. Uh, post the conference call in which they did not clarify. Uh, so apart from the whistleblower, uh, now uh, Sun Pharma has uh, done uh, and, and actually made right a lot of things that it did in its conference call. First of all, uh, the Aditya Medisales, which is the distribution arm, uh, Dilip Sangvi in the conference call had said that it will, at, if the investors want, they will merge it with itself uh, at an, uh, because uh, at, at cost. They haven't said uh, what the cost will be, but what they have said is that from being a related party, uh, Aditya Medisales will be now part of Sun Pharma. It will be transferred into a wholly owned subsidiary of uh, Sun Pharma. So that's the first thing, positive thing that's come out. Secondly, they will unwind the transaction. Remember, uh, close to 2200 crores of unsecured loans to, uh, to a non-related party was reported. The, man, uh, the management did not clarify what that was. Now they're saying is that was given to a company called Atlas Global Trading. Uh, during the time uh, uh, Halol was impacted impacted by GMPA issues. Uh, Sun Pharma was not uh, uh, able to adhere to the agri agreed supply schedule with Atlas and that is why uh, Sun Pharma paid uh, that uh, to Atlas. Now in principle Atlas will assign that money back to Sun Pharma. So that's another positive that's coming in. Appointment of auditor. There were a lot of uh, issues that were raised as far as uh, Walia and Timbadia is concerned as the 
auditors for a lot of Sun Pharma subsidiaries. They have said that they will be replaced by some other company. And finally, uh, this came out in the whistleblower uh, uh, statement which Money Life had put out in terms of loans given to Suraksha Realty. Sun Pharma says that neither any loans or guarantee were given uh, to Suraksha Realty. Sun Pharma actually says that these are all false statements and does not have any financial dealings with Suraksha, uh, with Suraksha Realty. So four uh, uh, important points which were not clarified, three during uh, uh, the conference call and one during uh, this whistleblower complaint uh, have been addressed by Sun Pharma. All right, so that's probably a step in the right direction. Uh, Mayresh, they, they're actually picking on all the sore spots and all the pain points that shareholders have had, and they're addressing each of them one by one. What does this say from the management's point of view? Well, as Neeraj was pointing out, I think it is uh, absolutely something in terms of damage control that the management is trying to do at this point of time. Uh, the apprehensions that have got raised on multiple fronts and multiple issues, uh, I think the management is trying to put forth uh, each stance and trying to take steps uh, probably in the direction uh, that should appease uh, shareholders, uh, both, both uh, substantial ones as well as the minority ones. Uh, so to that bit again, I think uh, the kind of exercises that they're planning and doing at this point of time, uh, I think how value creative that will be going forward and how much does that have a reflection in terms of reported numbers, I think that's going to be extremely critical. But yes, I think uh, if they are following these steps, I think it's a step in the right direction and a damage control in terms of what has happened in terms of their uh, uh, in, in terms of the beating that the stock has probably received. Dina, I just want to uh, make a couple of points out here. So mm -hmm. again, it, it is damage control, yes, but uh, as the announcement says that the domestic formulation distribution business to be transitioned to Sun Pharma's wholly owned subsidiary, uh, the distribution business uh, will be moved from Aditya Medi Sales, which is the current distributor, to a wholly owned subsidiary of Sun Pharma. So I would reckon from the looks of it that Aditya Medi Sales, whatever it is, remains as is, and the, Just and the, the business, business will be moved out from Aditya Medi Sales to another wholly owned subsidiary of Sun Pharma. It seems to be the case. They are saying, of course, that it will make effective post Q1, post receipt of all the requisite regulatory approvals. Mm -hmm. uh, so interesting that from a third party, the distribution business is now being transferred to a wholly owned subsidiary of the Third party, which was uh, later deemed to be a related party. Yes. Yes, but now it will go to a subsidiary which will be wholly owned by all the shareholders of Sun Pharma. So not just the promoters, but the minority shareholders as well. This, I reckon, should be viewed positively. Okay. It's a change that was needed, and I think the management has gone out and changed it. But we'll probably wait for experts to come in and speak about this. But this seems to be the move from the announcement and the nature of uh, the wordings of the announcement. Mm -hmm. Now let's wait and watch uh, what do experts have to say about this. But this should and, be And what would be the flow now when we're talking about uh, the internals of the company and, and, and the financials and how would all of that transition into the subsidiary of Sun Pharma? Yeah, I mean, again, difficult to lay a quick handle. I think somebody yeah. who's probably tracked this very, very closely will be able to say about the kind of business that uh, the distribution business which was under the Medi sales did. But I would presume that if, if it's being transferred and I don't know what the consideration, etc., that will be done or not done, etc., so on and so forth. But uh, this seems to be that the domestic formulations business will now be under a wholly owned subsidiary of Sun Pharma and that by itself it's should positive. probably be viewed positively. Let's wait and watch. Uh, uh, the stock gave hints of an upside yesterday. Uh, let's see if there's more upside in the session today. We'll wait and watch. Uh, just from a stock point of view, Mayuresh, would you be a buyer of Sun Pharma? No, I'm waiting and watching still the Vina, so at this point of time. All right, I think our technical experts are also here with us. So maybe we can just take this conversation up with uh, an expert once uh, we get uh, uh, to talk to one. So for now, let's bring in Hadrian Mendonka, Senior Technical Analyst of IFL, who's joining us on the show. Along with him, Amit Harchekar, Director at Index Genius Investment Advisors, is also here with us. Gentlemen, thanks very much for taking out the time, Hadrian. Uh, before I go to your index strategy, since we're on the topic of Sun Pharma, uh, can you uh, throw some light on whether you would take a trade in the stock or not? Because the stock, while it did what it did when it fell, it showed some signs of a rebound in yesterday's session. Yeah, definitely I would be a buyer, uh, you know, purely because of uh, the positive divergence that we, uh, we saw on Sun Pharma in yesterday's trade itself. Uh, in fact, if you see uh, the huge fall that, uh, that came, uh, you know, uh, the RSI was actually not hitting 
<coughs> was not hitting uh, new lows. In fact, it was way, way above the previous lows, RSI. So I think there is a huge uh, positive divergence that we are witnessing. And I think uh, uh, price is actually intending, uh, you know, to move higher from here on. So definitely, uh, you know, one can consider long positions at these levels. I think in the short term, a dead cat bounces on the cards, uh, which could lead Sun Pharma to move higher towards the 420 levels in the near term. Well, let's wait and watch if that happens. Uh, Gentlemen, we have about six minutes left, so I'll have to make a bit of a, we'll have to make a bit of a rapid fire with your index calls and your stock calls as well. Amit, to you first, a quick index strategy for the day today. Well, I would say I would uh, suggest going short on Nifty below 920 on futures, and we are expecting it to test 800 again. Top loss for your short trade would be 11,000. And stock specific, uh, I would be buying uh, Ultratech Cement. Uh, with a stop of 3800, we believe that is the one stop which has not broken support in the commodity space, and we are expecting the rally to extend towards 4050. Second, we'll be going short on ACC for one reason: it has uh, completed a diamond top in the near term, and now it projects a target of around 1300 in the near term. So we would suggest shorting uh, ACC futures below 1440. We are expecting a, a, a stop loss, stop loss of 1480, and 1350 would be a short term target. Sorry, Amit, uh, uh, so one is your conditional sell on the Nifty, which is fine. What is the first stock call? Sorry? The first stock call. One was ACC. What is the other stock call? Yeah, it, it was a short on ACC and buy on Ultratech Cement. Okay, so you have a buy call on Ultratech Cement and you have a sell call on ACC. So those are the levels that Amit Harchekar is giving and he's got a conditional sell on the Nifty. I presume sub uh, 920, 10, 920 for a target of 10,800. Hadrian, um, your thoughts, your index strategy, your stock calls. Yeah, good morning, Neeraj. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the uh, price is actually intending uh, and the Nifty is also uh, showing intentions that it wants to move higher. But the only uh, cause of concern here for me is that the auto index is uh, doing something different. And if you see the bank Nifty is also in, also not participating. Uh, you know, if we see yesterday, it was an underperformer if you compare it with the Nifty. So I think, uh, you know, the whole scenario is building up wherein uh, resistance is not being broken. I would be an aggressive buyer if we, if we see the Nifty futures breaking above the 11,010 levels. Uh, uh, you know, uh, that would actually open up uh, uh, another 150 to 200 points on the upside. But I think at the current juncture, till the 11,010 levels is not broken, I would actually stay on the sidelines. I would not actually go and short because we have index uh, uh, heavyweights like Reliance Infosys, SDFC Twins, uh, Kotak Bank doing the balancing act. Till they continue to balance, I think it's going to be difficult for the uh, for the Nifty to move lower. So I think right now, uh, you know, I would wait and watch. Uh, a break above 11,010 would be uh, a great level to enter, uh, you know, with longs. As far as uh, the stock uh, as are concerned, uh, first is uh, Bajaj Finance, and we are long on it. Uh, if we see uh, uh, the stock had uh, um, uh, broken down from an inverse cup and handle pattern two days earlier, but in yesterday's trade, we saw a very, very strong rejection of that breakdown, which means that price is intending to move higher. So the weight of the evidence is, in, uh, is indicating that one should uh, you know, uh, go long on Bajaj Finserve. We are expecting a short-term uh, target of uh, 6476, keeping a stop loss at 6332. Uh, now, the second stock that we are bearish on in the short term is a Bajaj Auto. Uh, as I already mentioned, the auto stocks are uh, are under tremendous pressure, and Bajaj Auto has just broken down from a rising wedge pattern. So one can consider going short Bajaj Auto Jan futures uh, for a target of 2650, keeping a stop loss at 2701. Okay, got that. Uh, stay on with us, gentlemen. Now, on to our special segment, Bloomberg Edge, where Yash Upadhyay tells us about a pattern that the Bloomberg terminal has thrown up on a stock. Yash, what's the stock on your radar today? Morning, Devina. So we are tracking uh, Bank of India on the charts and a sell call coming uh, on the back of the fear and greed indicator. Let's first try and understand what it is uh, and how to interpret it. Uh, well, basically, the fear and greed indicator is a spread between the two weighted moving averages of the true range and it oscillates on a zero basis line. How do you interpret it? You go long uh, when the fear and greed indicator flips its color from red uh, to green and you go short when the indicator goes from green uh, to red, which is in the case of Bank of India. Uh, we saw the stock rise sharply by more than 40% uh, following reports of bank recapitalization and a potential move uh, out of the PCA framework. Uh, the stock went from the levels of sub-80 to as high as 110. But since then, over the last few trading sessions, it has been consolidating. In fact, in the last three trading sessions, it has corrected uh, close to 4 4.5%. And with that, uh, the fear and greed indicator, which is in the lower panel, uh, that has seen big green uh, upticks and has now uh, flipped its color into the red, uh, indicating that there could be a potential downside from these current levels. 
How well has this worked in the past, Yash? So, Devi, now on an average, every time that the indicator has turned negative, uh, one could watch out for returns on the downside of close to 6.5% over the next 10 trading sessions. All right, uh, Yash, thanks very much for that. That is Bloomberg Edge. Obviously, we do Bloomberg Edge and we track it in greater detail from an equity market standpoint. We get you stocks every day. You can log on to BloombergQuinn.com to catch that segment. Moving on then, uh, we've got just about a few minutes left to go for market pre-open. That's just about three odd minutes left to go. Yesterday's big moves on Reliance. Mayuresh, what did you make out of that? No, so I think it was uh, something that was not expected, very frankly. But again, I think looking at the numbers, at the expectations thereof in terms of uh, the two new businesses, uh, retail and digital businesses, which houses telecom as well, I think the EBIT margin on the retail front at 4.2%, uh, the kind of top line that it is posting and the expectations in terms of the addressable market size, uh, I think that is a huge potential uh, for, for, for the size and scale that Alliance Retail can actually move up uh, the value chain. Uh, for the digital part of their business, again, I think when you're probably talking about ARPUs being a little bit constrained, uh, I think it was expected to be that way, but the expectations of the direct-to-home network uh, actually improving for the group and the expectations of the RMS share for the wireless business also improving and a large part of the capex behind, I think that is encouraging signs uh, from a consolidated perspective over the next three to four years. Uh, for their core businesses, obviously, I think a uh, large part of the Cape is obviously is behind them as well. Uh, and what you're totally talking in terms of the refining business with new IMO regulations coming through from 1st Jan 2020, with the middle distillates that it has got on the diesel side of almost 45 odd percent, the GRM pump is going to be obvious. So I remain positive on this. Okay, uh, we'll come back to you, Mayuresh. That's pre open just a few seconds away. The setup looks slightly weak this morning. And market pre open up on your screen. It'll be interesting to see how Sun Pharma uh, opens up for trade this morning. That's obviously the pre open ticks, but it gives you a clear indicator as to how the opening will also land up being. Nifty and Sensex absolutely flat, no triggers out there, but Sun Pharma, uh, I think, is still showing you a downtick of 10% in today's session. Um, that's 358 on the counter after the initial uh, move on the upside yesterday. It pulled back a little bit, I think two and a half or percent higher in yesterday's session. And some clarity coming in from the management uh, regarding how they're going to tackle uh, the Aditya Medisales issue, the distribution business going into another subsidiary of Sun Pharma. The stock though uh, is down about 10 odd percent. But remember, again, this is just the first stick, so you don't go by this. Wait for a few more minutes till, consoli till it consolidates. Other stocks then, Adani Ports down about 2 odd percent. You've got ICICI Bank, which is down 1.3 percent. Axis Bank is down one, uh, almost a percent. Hindalco, half a percent. Titan, half a percent. Maruti, Tata Steel, GSW Steel, HDFC limited down a quarter of a percent. Amongst the gainers, Kotak Mahindra Bank, um, good show yesterday, post numbers today as well as strong footing, uh, one and a half percent higher, Tech Mahindra up a percent, SPI, Bajaj Auto, Indian Oil, NTPC and India Bulls Housing are some of the key movers in the session. Infosys is also up a quarter of a percent, so IT, IT probably uh, is a pocket where there is continued amount of interest that keeps trickling in. The currency, some amount of strength that's come in today from 71.28 yesterday's close, the currency is at about 71.17. Okay, uh, now, you know, just, just before we get to Samir Kalra because he joins us to talk about Sun Pharma and by the way, Sun Pharma has moved into the green, so keep that at the back of your mind. Uh, this, as we said, we believe it's positive news. Just before we get to that though, two or three names, Prabhat Dairy should come up on your screen. Let's just see if that is reacting because the other companies are. Prabhat Dairy, again, this may change, but uh, the deal seems to be positive on the face of it. The stock reaction should ideally be positive. Let's wait and watch. The other dairy companies are also moving up. I saw Parag Milk Foods marginally higher in trade. Hudson Agro should be an interesting one to monitor today as well. That's the largest one. May not move as much, but let's wait and watch. Kaplan Point has some 18% uptick, so do watch out for that one. And Zensar, not the best of numbers. Is it reacting duly uh, to those numbers? About 3% lower in trade. HDFC MC, the last one that I want to just quickly mark before I move back to Sun Pharma. HDFC MC. Not a bad quarter. The top line number is left a bit to be desired, but the bottom line number is very strong. Margins very strong. The stock for now looking like it's starting off higher in Should trade. say Spark also. Okay, Sun Pharma Advanced Research, good point. Let's just bring that up before we get to Samir Kalra. Spark, well, about a percent and a half higher in trade today. Samir Kalra, founder of Target Investing, joins us right now to talk about this piece of news. Samir, thanks so much for taking the time out this early in the morning. 
yeah. what do you make of this piece of news uh, one it's it's a move in the right direction i presume but tell me if you differ and the implications for the stock thereof so i think uh, i do not differ on that uh the directive steps are much more active than uh, i think what investor community expected it to be so i think uh, by march or april uh, there are two things which are going to happen one is uh, atlas uh, loans in advance which are right now currently on the books that will get addressed the second is the indian formulation business which they have through the aditya sales uh, medi sales that gets corrected and uh, comes into the wholly owned subsidiary so i think the numbers will be better off because now the whole sales and the whole commission goes off towards aditya medi sales so i think over there it's much more positive than even on the number side and i think over there uh, you'll see a much more positive response from the investors at least from our side we are positive on this stock yeah, positive enough to go out and make a fresh investment samir and uh, by the way the uh, sub, the sun farm advance research also has moved up but does this soothe nerves enough to for you to go out and invest fresh money into sun farm so even on the couple of days when the whole uh, story unfolded and uh, it went down to 390 we were buyers over there and we bought uh, yesterday as well so i think over there in tranches if you are okay to buy this kind of a stock i think you know, on the longer term you'll benefit out of it hmm. all right uh, so mean uh, from an operations point of view uh, you know how do things change now for sun pharma so i think operations point of view the only difference which will be there is that the mainly the aditya medicines formulation business there might be a, a further you know employee hiring or that kind of way because or the absorption will be totally over there so that has to be seen how they handle the operation side of the medicines and how it works out but that should not have a meaningful impact right no on the overall i don't think so because it's more of a sales on the foot and the contracts are much more transferable as in the earnings are higher than the mm-hmm. uh, expense that you see over there okay got that samir thanks very much for joining us a uh, quick uh, take on uh, the latest development from sun pharma that's samir kala mayesh joshi uh, and we've got our technical analyst hadrian mendonka as well as amit archikar as well uh, here with us um, anything that you noticed within the it pack now that we've seen them clearly outperforming and i'll come to you hadrian from a trading standpoint we you know we const- constantly talk about how the it index takes support at the 200 day moving average but faces a hurdle at that 100 day moving average so anything that you're looking like that is ripe for a breakout on the upside that you could take a trade on Yeah, absolutely. Uh, NID Technology is one stock uh, that has been in tremendous uh, upswing, uh, you know, in the in the recent times. And uh, if you've noticed, it has actually broken the one two three zero resistance zone uh, that it was facing uh, for quite a long time now. In fact, one two three zero was the levels that it, that it uh, hit uh, in in the mid October of two thousand and eighteen. So it is the first time we have uh, moved past those important crucial hurdles. And I think uh, NID Technology would be a good opportunity where one can play the breakout on the upside. And according to the predictions that we are seeing. Uh, you know uh, there are high possibilities that uh, nnd technologies if one has a perspective of 3 to 4 months can move beyond the 1350 1360 levels so i think from a delivery uh, you know perspective as well nnd technology becomes a good buy at these levels hmm. would you trade sun pharma advanced research amit uh well i would wait for a uh, opening above 180 if that gets violated then uh, we have a clear reversal signals Whether rally could be extending all the way towards 195, but if this rally fades out or or is unable to sustain above 180, there is a, a possibility that stock could turn sideways between 172 and 180. What about Sun Pharma itself, Amit Archekar? 411 up 3% today. Well, I would enter in this stock only about 425 because that is where maximum long positions were built into for the current series. If we see prices sustaining about 425, then we have an upper boundary of around 455 to 460. But till then, there is a possibility that since it's a VWAP uh, which lasted for almost entire series, if that is not violated, we believe this stock would be under pressure in the coming days. Okay, interestingly, Devina, Quest Corp. Uh, 
is up about 10% in the session today, 10.5% if I'm not wrong. So a move for Quest Corp in the session today, it's amongst the top uh, gainers uh, in trade. So do watch out for this one, 10.55%. Then uh, the likes of Parag Milk Foods and a few others have done okay. And Central Bank of India has bounced back from the losses of yesterday. That looks like starting off higher. What is not looking good is Zensar Tech. Remember, we'll talk to the management at about 9.30 of Zensar Tech to take stock of what went wrong this quarter. But the margins were weak and it is showing in the way. The stock is reacting 6% lower right now. You want to come in? Uh, we've already spoken to Mayuresh about this. Um, Hiran, you want to come in with a quick thought on Zensar Tech? It's not a stock that we usually talk about in terms of trade, but any thoughts on the charts? Yeah, on the charts, the stock has been uh, you know, struggling uh, between this range of uh, 220 to 240. Uh, and this range has been, uh, you know, sustained for the past three to four weeks now. Uh, another thing uh, noticeable is that it is failing to uh, surpass its long-term 200-day moving average. That is also around the 240 levels. So I think as long as uh, the 200-day moving average is not broken out, I think one should uh, really not consider entering the stock. Uh, as far as uh, the lower range is concerned, below 220, we would see a, a complete range breakdown, which would actually lead uh, Zenza Technologies lower towards the 200 uh, levels as well. So right now, you know, the range, uh, either side of the range has to be broken for a certain, uh, uh, you know, some kind of uh, direction to take place. All right, gentlemen, uh, just stay on with us. Uh, we're minutes away from market opening, and we'll tell you all that you need to know to stay ahead in trade today. First up, Asian Paints will report its quarter three earnings today. Revenue may rise 15%, aided by double-digit volume growth. However, higher input costs, mainly oscillating crude oil prices, may have snubbed margins to a five-quarter low. Big news from the dairy sector. Prabhat Dairy has decided to sell its dairy business to Thirumala Milk Products for 1,700 crore rupees. The sale will be carried out in two tranches. Note, Thirumala Milk Products is a subsidiary of France based group like Talis. A day after completing the deal with LIC, IDBI's bank, IDBI Bank's board has approved reinitiation re of divestment process of its stake in IDBI Federal Insurance. HDFC AMC posted a subdued revenue growth of 2% YOY, but profits jumped 25% aided by lower commission expenses and higher other income, which went up by two times this quarter. Lastly, key brokerage calls for the day. CLSA maintains a sell rating on Ashok Leyland and cuts the target price to 75 rupees per share, while Macquarie initiates an outperform rating on Nestle with a target price of 12,994 rupees per share. Well, interestingly, it's the dairy companies and Prabhat Dairy, clearly the standout stock of the morning, up about 20% in trade. Uh, well, the street seems to be liking this. Uh, we spoke to Mayuresh Joshi and he believed that he would want to uh, wait out. Mayuresh, am I getting it right? You mentioned that you would want to wait for a bit and understand what the management does in terms of rewarding the shareholders before you take a call on this one? Oh, absolutely. And uh, I think the holdings that we've got probably in this sector is Hudson Agro as a clear disclaimer. Okay, so you are betting on Hudson Agro as a stock that's amongst the largest ones. Uh, but Mayuresh, why a Hudson Agro over maybe a Parag Milk Foods or some of the others? I think it's, it's uh, got, as you rightly said, I think the processing capacities are far larger. The kind of positioning that it has probably got at this point of time, uh, I think they're in a far better position. Uh, and again, I think if you probably look at their balance sheet dynamics, I think uh, they are a relatively better placed uh, compared to its peers. Uh, so I think uh, we are probably going in with uh, relative steady earnings growth that this company can post. Uh, and with that logic again, I think uh, the kind of expectations that one clearly can build out in your estimates over the next three to four years, uh, I think this seems to be a steady compounder going forward as well. Uh, would you trade Asian Pains, Hadrian, ahead of numbers? The stock yesterday put up a strong show. Uh, second half of trade in particular made the stock end at the highest point of the day. Yeah, in fact, with a disclaimer, uh, uh, we have been advising clients, uh, uh, you know, out here to go long on Asian Pains, and definitely I would be, uh, you know, a long uh, buyer in Asian Pains. I think uh, yesterday's move was incredible. Uh, the um, the breakout that we saw after a, a two-week uh, range breakout was also pretty strong with good volumes. I think on the upside, it has a potential of moving towards the 1450-1455 levels in the near term. All right. Uh, the other one is a Kotak Mahindra Bank. Um, Amit, I'll come to you with this one. Yesterday is clear performer. Uh, obviously, the, the, the boost coming in from the earnings performance. But uh, has it 
uh, created any of a pricing um, excitement for you to go ahead and trade the stock? Well, I would be quite comfortable to buy the stock on a decline of around 1220 to 1225 because on the upper side, uh, the major supply zone is between 1285 to 1290. Even uh, previously, the stock tried to break that, but we had seen a massive selling taking place. So, would be quite cautious, uh, would not be chasing this stock on a rally, but uh, on a dip around 1220 would be a good plan. Well, do watch out for some names. Just uh, one odd Quest Corp, which is uh, up and about in the session today, above our 10%. Mayuresh, a quick thought. We'll, of course, very close to market open, but uh, maybe 15, 20 second view. Do you track Quest Corp? No, unfortunately, I don't need it. <laughs> okay, well, that's a three second view, but uh, Mayuresh doesn't track it, so really can't uh, argue too much against that. Okay, Mayuresh, just stay on. We'll take in final thoughts from you, but watch out for this one too, Devina. Uh, Sun Pharma, Sun Pharma Advanced Research, Prabhat Dairy, and Quest Corp, seemingly the three most important stocks of the morning. Yeah, and that's where most of the action lies right now. But let's uh, get in some top trading ideas from our technical experts this morning. Uh, so we'd start off with you, Hadrian. Uh, where are you going to put your money? Yeah, I'll sell a Canfin Homes uh, Jan Futures. Uh, we have seen uh, a descending triangle pattern breakdown in uh, in a previous day uh, with good volumes. I think one can consider short selling uh, Canfin Homes Jan Futures for a target of 258, keeping a stop loss at 268 on the upside. Got that. Amit Harshikar, what about your top call? Well, I would uh, suggest shorting in the Sinbank Futures with a stop of 5, 1535. We are expecting uh, this triangle breakdown to take stock lower towards 1470. Okay, um, Jamin, Steon will just take in opening thoughts from you post-market open, but it looks like we'll start off flat. Individual stocks will be the order of the day. Let's see if the Nifty Bank and the Nifty IT continue to give support to the index or they pull back after some days of an upting, especially in the Nifty IT name. So that's uh, something important that we will monitor in the session today. Here's how we are starting off though. Uh, flat for all the key benchmark indices for the Nifty Bank as well. Just about 42 odd points in the red, but a bit of a pullback. The Sensex in Nifty now about a quarter of a percent, by the way, mind you, a third of a percent now. So some weakness, but let's see if this lasts. The world markets, remember, are a subdued lot. The US futures are already pointing towards a half a percent down tick. Mid caps and the small caps, which are anyways down in trade yesterday, at least the mid cap index starts off about a quarter of a percent lower again. So uh, definite weakness at the broader end too. The market breadth won't be the most optimistic right now. Bring up the heat map and let's see what's moving there. Um, I think the larger action is outside the index, but Sun Pharma has made its presence felt. Up about 4% now after the 2.5% up move yesterday. So the big mover in the session today is Sun Pharma. 12, um, 8 plus 6, about 16% carnage on Thursday and Friday and recovering some bit of that lost ground in the session today. Kotak Bank after the 2% up move yesterday continues to move higher. 1.5% is HDFC Bank giving it company. No, not quite. HDFC is not in the top top three rows, so must be losing out a little bit in the session today. Reliance takes a bit of a breather in the session today. Infosys takes a bit of a breather. I would reckon Nifty IT must be giving up some of the gains of the last few days. It's near resistance levels any which ways, so do watch out. And HDFC Bank is lying subdued about a quarter, half a percent lower in trade. So that's uh, essentially the news flow. Reliance on the downside after a manic rally the last couple of days. Sun Pharma and Kotak Bank on the upside. I believe Spark and Prabhat Dairy could be active stocks too, but Devina, are they are they looking as attractive? Well, Spark is 5.5% uh, higher this morning, but um, you've got uh, a Prabhat Dairy and pull that stock up to see whether the 20% uh, upper circuit continues from pre open, and yes, it does. So, uh, 111 for Prabhat Dairy. Uh, you've got the likes of a Quest Corp, which was up 10% in pre open, but in oh, at open, the stock is up about three and a quarter of a percent. Parag Milk Foods in tow with uh, what Prabhat Dairy is doing, so not not to, the, to that extent, but just about two and a half percent higher uh, for a Parag Milk Foods as well. Future Retail has moved up four percent in today's session. So that's looking strong. Zensar Technology should pull that up on earnings as well as an HDFC, AMC, Zensar Tech, uh, disappointing uh, 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 cut coming in there, three and a quarter percent, slightly more mixed bag on the earnings performance though. Um, HDFC, AMC, 1.7 percent higher in intraday trade, uh, in, in early morning trade rather. Raymond is up 1.3 percent right now. You've got the likes of a Sterlite Tech, which has moved up. Petronet LNG is up 1 percent, and that's the kind of gainer that we're seeing amongst the stocks which are 
losing out. You've got the likes of a Vakarangi, which has finally, uh, you know, stalled that uh, rally that we had seen in the last few trading sessions, where it was a continuous upper circuit after upper circuit, and today it's on lower circuit. Uh, Koromandal from the fertilizer space is down four percent. We already spoke about Zensar, so you've got an LNT Financial Holdings that's down three percent. ITI, a big mover in yesterday's session on that big order win of about twelve hundred crores, um, that was up in uh, I think twelve or thirteen percent today is down 2%. Ashok Leyland, 52-week uh, lows for the counter and, and that's really taking a drubbing um, you know, uh, over the last few trading weeks. Enables real estate also down about 2 to and a quarter of a percent. So broader market picture, slightly tilted towards the bears this morning. Advanced decline ratio as well, more favorable towards the bears. 418 stocks advancing, 662 stocks declining. Okay. A quick opening thoughts from our experts. Amit Harchekar, I want to come to you on Spark because you mentioned that you will go along on it only if it crosses 180. 180 half currently. Yeah, definitely it would be a buy, but uh, the stop loss would be 174 on a closing basis and the short term target would be close to 198. Okay, short term target 198, a stop loss close to 174 on Sun Pharma Advanced Research. Uh, Kotak Bank, Hedren Mendonka, 1292, up about 2%. Would you take money off the table? No, I think I'll ride the momentum because, uh, you know, uh, we've seen very good uh, uh, upswing in the past four days. I think this momentum can get carried forward. We are still not in the, uh, you know, overbought area. There is still more scope uh, uh, for a Kotak Bank to move higher. I think uh, 1300 plus should be, uh, you know, the levels where you can actually consider taking some money off the table. Hedron as well as Amit, thanks so much, Jamin, for joining in today and giving us that perspective. Mohiresh, just before we thank you, Yes Bank, ahead of its numbers, was down about 3% yesterday, I believe, started off as the weakest hand on the Nifty today. Any thoughts here before we let you go? So again, uh, Neeraj, I think the numbers are expected to be on the better side. Advances growth expected to be pretty strong. What you've probably seen in terms of uh, reported asset quality numbers as well. Obviously, I think the provisioning is going to move up. Uh, quarter on quarter and that will continue till you reach a certain threshold. Uh, what they probably deliver in terms of the divergence with RBI is going to be an extremely critical factor. And again, I think the biggest overhang in terms of who probably gets appointed at the helm. Uh, so I think reasonable set of numbers expected, but I think the street is probably expecting these two other factors to probably still lay a huge emphasis in terms of how the stock probably moves. All right, Mayuresh, we leave it at that. Thanks so very much for joining and appreciate you Thank taking you so out the time. Much. Moving on then, Mihir Vora, Director and Chief Investment Officer at Max Life Insurance is joining us on the show right now. Mihir, thanks very much and good morning to you. Let's start off uh, with the earnings season since we're in the midst of it. Most of the larger names have come out. Uh, the IT earnings from the large cap space did not disappoint. Some of the larger private sector banks have not disappointed. Do you see that this earnings may actually you know, turn the corner stone for us and we could actually see some amount of better earnings coming in and which could trigger re-rating for some of the stocks. Uh, good morning. Well, I think uh, the better quality results are coming in a bit earlier. Uh, we haven't still seen the results of the commodity and energy complex uh, linked companies. So to that extent, I reserve my you know judgment on whether the earnings season has gone well. Uh, overall, I would say that the market earnings growth that was expected for FY19 at the beginning of the year have have started ge getting tapered down. So the trend that we have seen over the last four or five years where we start with a 20% growth expectation and end up with a low single digit number uh, is likely to continue. Though this year it may not be a low single digit number, it may be a high single digit number. But definitely not the 15 to 18% growth that we were expecting or hoping uh, with a 7.5% GDP growth rate for the market as a whole. I think in this, in this uh, second half of FY19, the disappointments probably will come from the uh, commodity and energy link complex because we have seen oil and other commodity metals etc prices coming down at this point uh, keeping in mind various other factors affecting equity markets not just domestically but globally as well would it be prudent to probably just sit on the sidelines for a bit and get more clarity let the volatility run out, run its course ahead of elections and then make fresh investments or take another approach where you uh, play the markets via defensives and those low beta names uh, and hold on to your high beta investments for those multi-baggers a little bit later on in the year. It should be a stock-by-stock -stock approach, uh, frankly. Uh, 
while we have a lot of polarization in the market, so the expensive stocks, which are liked by everyone, continue to be uh, very expensive and probably getting more expensive as the Nifty uh, nears about 11,000. But we also have a huge amount of uh, beaten down stocks in the in the in that same market, where probably value is already beginning to emerge. So my guess is uh, it's not even a question of sector or or you know large cap small cap approach. It's I think uh, approach that uh, uh, you know should be taken as a stock by stock uh, approach. And I think there is enough alpha to be made uh, and enough absolute returns to be made if you get the stocks right at these levels. Mihir, good morning, Nira uh, Jair. You know, Sun Pharma over the I'm not asking for a stock specific comment, by the way. But I know you can't talk stocks. But Sun Pharma over the last two or three days after being beaten down has taken a bit of a damage control measure. They've uh, tried to do a few things. You would probably be aware of the news. My question to you is, uh, how would the institutional community view any stock or any company of this nature? Index company, pedigree company has enjoyed pedigree status for a really long time, got involved in something and is now trying to do damage control. Uh, do the, does the valuation derating that has happened uh, stay, or do you believe the turnaround, even the valuation derating, happens very quickly? So it's a function of what the market believes the future will be uh, in all these cases, and as long as there are no serious issues with the, you know, accounting or the reported numbers, etc., and it's only a question of. Uh, Certain uh, you know subjective calls which were probably taken. Uh, I think the market can look past in the in the in the next few uh, you know quarters, uh, as long as there are no fundamental issues with the uh, with the reported numbers, etc. Okay, you mentioned the energy space and waiting for those results to come out. The one number that did come out uh, seemed reasonably okay, not just on the telecom side, but also on the energy business side. But I, I want to I want to refer to the telecom business. Therefore, Mir, uh, what happens here? It's a Space, I mean, it's a large enough pocket now not to ignore at the same time. Say for Reliance, the other two are caught in a state of flux with the pricing pressures. Uh, in your portfolios, do you look to uh, add or keep telecom at all, or is it a shun sector for the time being? Uh, for us, it's been an avoid sector for quite some time, and we don't see the competitive pressures uh, going away in a hurry. I think it's a it's a sector where probably you will be left with two or three players, and that's where we are already heading to. Uh, but in the next one year or so, I don't see the competitive intensity really going away. Uh, capex requirements will continue to grow up. There will be uh, in the future requirements for spectrum bidding, also uh, rebidding, etc. So I think the the you know the overall situation where you have a lot of investments to be done and competitive intensity not going away that will remain for the next couple of years. So it is still a sector which which we are avoiding. Okay, Meer, uh, the <coughs> behavior of uh, companies in the CV space seems to suggest that the market, at least for now, believes that the pain is not over <coughs> and is probably undecided about where in the cycle are we. Where do you think we are? We've had three good years of a CV up cycle. Are we at the stage of the down cycle or is it difficult to call right now? So the way we are seeing GST collections, it that, that definitely appears to be some kind of a slowdown. Uh, we are already seeing slowdown in certain key numbers like uh, rail freight, uh, cement sales, uh, passenger and two-wheeler sales, etc. So the, we are seeing some signs of a uh, overall economic slowdown for sure. And CV tends to be an even higher beta play, probably with a little bit of a lag on such uh, such cyclical movement. So I think uh, uh, on the CV space, we'd rather begin to see the improvement in numbers before we take a, a, a positive call. So as of now, since the numbers are still not coming in, we are underweight the sector. And non-CV autos, uh, what's the call there? I mean, be it two-wheelers, be it four-wheelers? Uh, well, that's a space where we are really not happy in the sense uh, We've been overweight. We had been overweight on this segment for like almost you know two to three years continuously, and uh, made a lot of money, uh, a lot of outperformance because of that. Uh, but we are kind of sad that uh, the numbers have started slowing down sharply. And this is a segment where we do believe that you know that is the future of India because uh, cars, especially, are not that well penetrated, and there's a long uh, you know penetration story there uh, to go. But if, even if even if that segment is not showing signs of growth, it means that there is a genuine consumer slowdown. So we have gone underweight in the sector, but it's with a lot, with a, it's a, I would say with a heavy heart. 
All right. Uh, what is the strategy that you're adopting me here right now? I mean, while there are different approaches that people take to investing in a market like this, what is your strategy? So being a long only fund, the mandate is of course to generate uh, our performance uh, uh, versus the benchmark. So there we are looking at uh, our core philosophy with it, which is uh, growth at a reasonable price. So wherever we are seeing that growth is maintained or, or accelerating, uh, we are looking into those segments. So IT is one segment that we have been overweight now almost for 12 months. Uh, after being underweight the previous two to three years, uh, we shifted our stance to overweight uh, because of a couple of things. One is that the currency was, was weakening, so that was a tailwind for the sector. And the US economy especially was doing quite well. So we changed our stance from underweight to overweight uh, and we are maintaining that stance. Reasonable valuations are still there uh, because of the you know kind of growth that we are seeing and the good quality of uh, cash flows, etc. in this segment. So IT is one segment uh, we continue to uh, be overweight on, I think, and we shall be. Uh, the other thing that we have been uh, shifting, uh, have shifted uh, in the early part of the year and which we are likely to maintain is underweight on NBFCs. Uh, a, there are two kinds of NBFCs, one which are expensive and still growing, uh, but we don't like them because of valuations, and the other ones which are not growing because of the uh, ALM uh, issues. So in, in both the cases, we have very limited exposure to NBFCs, almost, uh, almost negligible. So we continue to play with the private sector banks, and within the private sector banks, earlier we were overweight completely on the more retail and SME kind of segments, but now even on the corporate banks, uh, we do see signs of uh, uh, growth coming back. And uh, moreover, corporate banks in general compared to the retail banks had been cheaper. So to that extent, uh, that's a change in stance. We are going over it on the co corporate banks also. Mm. Would you, uh, you know, consider uh, looking at a possibility of real estate picking up flavor? I mean, in terms of, uh, it's, it's, it's obviously a small space. You have no large cap real estate player as such. It's, it's more a play on the mid cap size. but. Uh, would that be something that would interest you now? I mean, at least from the names that have a stronger balance sheet. Sure. Uh, in real estate, in general, what we are seeing is that uh, the Bangalore-oriented uh, uh, players are doing better. So we have some very limited exposure, but only in the uh, in that in that in that pocket. Uh, apart from that, uh, the NCR and Bombay markets continue to be quite sluggish. Uh, and a lot of the players out there are still uh, leveraged, etc. So to that extent, uh, it's a story that uh, should reflect the growth of India. But as of now, there's not much to do there. Okay. Um, Mihir, uh, just my final question really. As, we, uh, as I hear you, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I get a feeling that you, you believe, or maybe uh, I get a feeling that uh, your, your assumption or your belief must be that the markets are likely to show a hint of weakness as opposed to becoming strong over the larger part of the year. Is that a correct assumption? Uh, yes, so uh, our estimates for FY19 and FY20 in terms of GDP yeah. growth are lower than the consensus estimates. We don't believe that we are on a trajectory of 7.5% GDP growth. Uh, growth rate even for FY20. So to that extent, uh, our expectations are lower than the market and uh, by that logic, yes, the markets are a little bit on the expensive side. Uh, so we would be cautious on equities. Would your EPS estimate be on the Nifty for FY20? Uh, sorry, could you repeat that? Your EPS estimate for FY20, Nifty EPS estimate. So we're expecting about 15% uh, growth uh, on FY20 versus uh, FY19. All right, got that. Whereas the consensus would be closer to say 20, 22%, 20, 22%. Yeah, yeah I've, I've heard uh, even till 24%, but that is primarily because of uh, you know a few heavy yeah. weights, a few large caps within the index, which have skewed the EPS earnings on the higher side. But Mihir Bora, it was a pleasure chatting with you. Thank you so very much for joining in. Appreciate you taking out the time this morning. That's Mihir Bora there with his views. Thank uh, you. My pleasure. Views on the markets. Uh, Mark, for ourselves, the Nifty is down about half an odd percent right now. Sensex also looking weak. Banks on the lower side, 100 odd points given up on the bank Nifty, so nothing much is happening there. The mid caps and the small caps continue to reel under pressure. Yep. So.
days of pain now uh, two days of pain now uh, for the large longer uh, the broader markets let's see if this lasts we take a break on the other side of the break we talk about a company which has some pain and decode the september quarter earnings or december quarter earnings excuse me with sandeep kishore of zensar technologies and then dinar dubashi of lnd finance holdings <coughs> anything and everything about your investments we're just a touch away monday to friday at 12:30 pm only on bloomberg quint This is a show which gets you a complete trap of all the stocks that are buzzing in trade. Everyone's a price taker, not a price maker out there. There are better opportunities in the marketplace. The return ratios will improve, margins will improve. What are you seeing? Valuations are extremely expensive. It would take 100 years of profits to really pay off the entire debt. Not all good businesses are good investments. Good return on equity could be expected, and I think that will sustain. Their numbers, etc., were pretty sluggish. How much longer they can sustain? I'm not too sure. It has never been the scenario with any of the stocks. It's an avoid for him at this point of time. I wouldn't write it off in such a hurry. We are getting into more complex chemistry. Join me as I navigate the hottest stocks and help you pick the right stock at the right time. Welcome back. Uh, you're watching Indian Open. Let's start a discussion now this morning with Zensar Technologies. Foreign exchange losses and transition costs to large deals has clearly taken a toll on Zensar Technologies. The IT company saw its profit drop by nearly 40% in the third quarter. Meanwhile, the company plans to exit its non-core business. So will that help it tide over these trying times? Let's find out from the CEO and MD of the company, Mr. Sandeep Kishore. Uh, Mr. Sandeep, thanks very much for joining in. Uh, first off, uh, could you give us some key highlights of the quarter gone by? And while the revenues looked good enough, uh, it was a pressure that built up on the margins as well as the profit numbers. Sure, happy to, to be here and give you a little more detail on the qu uh, quarter three performance for us. As you called out, actually revenue for us has done quite well. On uh, constant currency, uh, it's 4.5% sequential growth. Uh, close to 18% on year on year for our core business, you know, which basically excludes the the ROW business and the third-party maintenance business. Year on year growth actually has been north of 21%. Uh, so on the revenue front, you know, we've done quite well. It's largely come on account of some very large deals that we won in quarter three and also in the later half of the quarter two. We won about 200 plus million dollars of deal for the first time uh, in a quarter ever in our company in quarter three. And in the previous quarter also we had won 200 million dollars. YTD, 
we have won you know over about 700 plus million dollar worth of deals several of those deals are actually in very very advanced stages of execution and the transition cost which comes with execution of these deals you know they do impact short term margin profile and that's what has happened and that's why gross margin actually dipped by about 3.8% sequentially even though on an year on year basis it grew by 4.3% and that dip in gross margin actually impacted the the operating margin as well at the ebitda level uh, profit after tax you actually called out we had a forex loss of about 2 and a half million dollars in the quarter uh, compared to the previous quarter which had a gain of 5 million in quarter 2 and hence the delta is about 7 and a half million dollars that's why the percentage looks actually at 40 plus percent or so but overall on the operating performances i think we are very focused to execute to the strategy that we have defined uh, and we are doing quite well all right so, so two two points there uh, one uh, you said that the transition cost because of uh, the kind of deals that are in the final stages of completion in, and execution have impacted uh, uh, your numbers this time along with that you had um, you know the base factor kicking in uh, which reflected on the profitability so could we could we assume that the, this is just the effect that happens this quarter and next quarter we resume back to mean Yes, yeah, so the core business that we've consistently been calling out now for the last three or four quarters, uh, we've been operating at about 15% EBITDA range there, which was also there in quarter two. That dipped to 12.5% in quarter three. Uh, we are quite committed to actually bring that back in the midterm to the 15% range. So absolutely, yes. All right. Uh, let's talk about uh, you know what the focus now is going to remain for Zensar Technologies and, and what is your strategy to make sure that you maintain those growth uh, margins for yourself and uh, what's the approach that you're going to be taking to make sure that uh, you know your turnaround playbook goes as per plan. So you know I think it's a great question. We've always maintained that we are a digital first player. If you just take the underlying factors on where the growth are coming in. Uh, cloud infrastructure services business has done exceptionally well for us in quarter three. Uh, we grew 17% sequentially. That's a phenomenal number, you know, coming around. Almost all the core sectors, which is high tech, uh, financial services, and retail, have actually delivered quite well on the revenue performance. We now have over a billion dollar worth of pipeline that we are currently uh, fighting and you know trying to win. Uh, we have won several of those, you know, over the last two quarters. Uh, we've invested heavily on site. Uh, we've added about 1,200 net headcount in the last 12 months. 45% of that net headcount actually is added on site. So investment which is aligned to what really matters to our customers in the digital and the cloud area is where we are executing well. We are fighting, uh, you know, and we have put together a lot of investment. So I feel pretty confident about our ability to, to stay and execute it particularly in the core sector, which are financial services, largely insurance, uh, retail and consumer, and the high-tech categories here. Do you see uh, it getting a little bit difficult in order to replicate the, the $100 million kind of deal sizes that we have been seeing? So those deal sizes have actually been coming down. There are far and fewer $100 plus million deal. That's just the industry trend. There are several deals between $25 million to $100 million here. Uh, in the last uh, 18 months, we have won $200 plus million deals, and we have won several between $25 to $100 million deals. Uh, in, in just the cloud infrastructure category business, which I called out earlier, we have won seven deals which are between 10 to you know, 65 to $70 million. So there are a lot of deals which are there in what I call the mid-range sector, there are fewer deals in the hundred plus million dollar category. Uh, and the return on digital platform that we've built, now we've added artificial intelligence, uh, smart platform and human experience. I think, you know, keep us in a pretty good stead in a competitive landscape. What exactly according to you uh, could be, uh, you know, a, a clear headwind for you uh, in the near term? You know, while you're talking about uh, replacing those uh, $100 million deal sizes with the smaller ticket sizes, and that's coming your way, do you believe that your larger clients that account for about 25% plus of your revenues, uh, you know, repeat orders coming in, repeat deals coming in from there, seem to be a little bit of a hurdle, or that's not a concern? 
No, it's not a concern at all. Actually, let me just call that out. The top 20 clients, if you've seen, has actually grown 27% year on year at the end of quarter three. That's like a good 10% higher than the overall company average. So as part of our strategy, we've been you know, deepening our investment and our categories of relationship building and competencies with the clients that really matter for our growth. So the top five, the top 10, and the top 20, all categories of customers on a year-on-year -year basis have actually shown significant improvement. Now, we are also finding net new deals because at the end of the day, we have about 100 customers in the million-dollar-plus category. That number was 81 a year ago. So we've added, give or take, you know, 19, 20 customers in million-plus-dollar category. Uh, we've added five into the five-plus million-dollars category. So focus for us at Zensar is be the, uh, be the ROD, return on digital partner, for our customers which are large and which have headroom to grow. And that's where we have been executing quite well. Okay. Just last few questions, <coughs> Sandeep. Um, uh, being on uh, what is your plan uh, with regards to uh, your primary three verticals and the growth thereof, and also in you know, your exiting of your non-core assets, what, what is the trajectory there? So let me take the second one first. We've called out the third-party maintenance business and the ROW business as the two non-core businesses because they are at a PAT level, margin dilutive to us, and we are exploring all options. So let's just see what happens there. We are committed to find the right home for those businesses, and we are in multiple stages of discussion on those two businesses. And that's why a couple of quarters ago, we actually started calling out the core business and the performance in the core business which has been in the 15% EBITDA range. Traditionally, last quarter it did dip, and we are committed to bring that back. On the core business, you know, which you mentioned about financial services, particularly insurance, uh, we acquired a company uh, which does guide wire implementation into the PNC sector, uh, and we've done very well. We won four new contracts in the, in the insurance, particularly in the US and in the UK market, which basically to digitally enable between one to $5 billion insurance companies. So that's a big focus for us in guide wire implementation in the PNC category. Uh, retail, we are doing omni-channel implementation, largely led by analytics, uh, AI, and experience. And we have done quite well. The last quarter was a bit soft. Uh, the growth was about 1.1% on the retail. But with the pipeline uh, that we are looking at, I, I do believe it will come back up pretty soon. Financial services actually grew by close to 9.6% on a sequential basis. Uh, high tech, which is the other sector, uh, is doing quite well. It's grown about 3.7% on a sequential basis. Uh, we have some very large clients there. And the, what is key driver there is about IoT. It's about experience. It's about commerce. And a lot of integration, system integration work uh, that we keep seeing in the high tech and the manufacturing sector. And that's where the competency of the organization that we have built over the last uh, two plus years, uh, including the Zen Labs focus that we brought, is really helping us uh, you know, compete in the marketplace. Uh, Sandeep, it was a pleasure chatting with you. Congratulations on your, uh, on your numbers and hope uh, uh, to see these numbers reverting back. You said 15%. Uh, we'll wait and watch for that by the end of the year. Thank you so very much for joining us this morning. Thank you. All right, that's the management at uh, Zensar Tech talking about their quarterly performance. We'll move mm -hmm. on to the next one, LNT Finance. Uh, took a cautious approach to lending in quarter three, largely influenced by the unraveling of LNFS crisis and the uncertain liquidity scenario. Disbursements dipped 20% on a YOI on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis, uh, but on a YOI basis, the numbers look fairly okay. To give us an update on the LNFS exposure and decode the numbers in further detail, joining us on the show now is MD and CEO Dinanath Dubashi. Mr. Dubashi, good having you. Thanks so much for joining in. I want to start off with uh, the the broad mood around the space and your company as well on one the cost of capital and the liquidity situation how are both of these as we speak how how were they in the quarter so generally headline is that liquidity is definitely improved but uh, most definitely there is a flight to quality uh, we see uh, mutual funds banks uh, pension funds uh, insurance companies more preferring the paper of good NPFCs, and that is where we see that we are at advantage so that is number one number two uh, there are two factors which are working uh, is definitely uh, cost of bank lines uh, as you know banks have increased interest rate cost of bank lines 
has gone up already uh, and uh, cost of CPEs have come down right and hence we expect largely I had initially indicated that from Q2 to Q3 the in increase will be about 25 to 30 basis points and from Q3 to Q4 the increase will be another 20 basis point that is what I had indicated three months back now it looks like obviously from Q2 to Q3 the increase has been just about 17 basis points and we expect Q4 the weighted average of all this uh, you know happening the increase will be between 0 to 5 basis points. So Q4 we expect largely the weighted average cost to be remaining steady uh, at Q3 uh, range. That's what uh, general expectation is as of now. Okay, Mr. Dubashi, uh, what about quarter 4 before we get to some other aspects of quarter 3? Do you reckon that it will be more benign than what was earlier believed? I, I think Q4 will be much more benign than what we initially believed it to be. Uh, I think uh, some uh, uh, good confidence building statements made by the regulator and the government has helped. Uh, some banks have taken some good measures by buying uh, you know, the portfolios of some companies. Uh, no defaults happened uh, you know, as November as they were rumored to be. And based on this, slowly confidence is coming back. I, I believed always that it was a crisis of confidence than any real crisis in the sector. And as slowly and surely, uh, I believe that as other good NBFCs also declare results, uh, the situation should, uh, you know, the confidence should come back even more. But the headline statement, if I have to make, Q4 will be definitely more benign uh, than what we thought three months back that Q4 will be, surely. Okay, so Q4 more benign. So while caution prevents on the street, l and Finance Holdings seems to be very confident. But you would have gone slow on developer loans, Mr. Dabashi. How tough is the scene out there and what's the outlook? Yes, absolutely. You are right that developer loans, one has to be very selective. So first of all, let me say that we are developer loans uh, is our core business. It is our strength because of our group strength. Uh, LNT builds uh, buildings for many developers, top class developers. That knowledge, those contacts, that uh, you know, proprietary knowledge uh, gives us tremendous strength in this business. And we are, uh, we believe that our credit, our uh, early warnings. Uh, mechanisms are one of the best so we are it is our core business having said that uh, yes uh, there is clearly uh, you know we were always doing the top builders a and b category builders there we will be even more careful in selection of builders uh, making sure that even within those builders the project that we select will be very strong projects and the monitoring will be even even more stronger that if our monitoring team used to uh, visit uh, a particular site at a particular frequency, that frequency will be increased. There will be certain project where the monitoring team is per permanently placed. So, uh, you know, doing all this, we believe that uh, we are mitigating the risk well and it's a good opportunity actually to lend to uh, excellent real estate projects. Okay, but so while 34% is a good number, but slower than the 50% number in quarter one, which you did before. Will these numbers continue? Oh, no, 34%. So first of all, there is a very clear base effect. If you would see our disbursement in quarter three is actually lower than quarter two. So which shows that we have to be, we have been much more selective. So uh, the growth rates, you know, the book growth rate is a is a function of your book rundown and new disbursements. But largely, disbursement should remain around this 1500, 1600 crores per quarter level. That is what we expect. It of course, uh, disbursements here are not like retail. There is no run rate, right? You have to find good projects. But let me, if I have to put strategically, it is no longer the matter of liquidity availability. It is a matter of risk appetite and uh, credit. Uh, uh, you know, uh, number of projects passing through our credit matrices. Uh, if we don't find any good business, we will not do it. It's as simple as that. Okay. Uh, now, you know, LNFS becomes very important, Mr. Dubashi, because uh, a lot of mutual funds are talking about how the subsidiaries, the step-down subsidiaries might not honor the repayments as well, and therefore there could be markdowns to NAVs. What happens in such a scenario to you? Because I presume you have exposure to ILNF and its subsidiaries via the road projects as well. 
you know, the treatment that various lenders will do is different. So let me state, you know, because this issue is very muddied and very confused. So let me be uh, divided into two. One is the uh, NCLAT moratorium order and the effect of that. And second is any actual losses. And this too, it is very important to separate the two issues. So first, let us talk about the moratorium order. We have taken very strong legal opinion, including of a former Chief Justice of India, that the moratorium order clearly refers to any uh, precipitative action to be taken by the lenders. So early repayment or foreclosures or any legal thing, it doesn't stop any regular payments. This is our view. Uh, as of 31st December, all our payments payments are current uh, and as you rightly said uh, ILFS some subsidiaries may take a separate view and it is to be seen but the good thing is that the next NCLAT hearing is on 28th which is just seven days from now and we will get the clarification and we'll hopefully it will cl uh, clear a lot of air on this moratorium part so that's as far as moratorium is concerned let us take the worst case scenario we don't believe so but let us take the worst case scenario that the moratorium even uh, you know uh, uh, is about the normal repayment uh, what will happen is yes normal repayments may get delayed but the fact that all of our six projects are operating four are annuity based for two there are very clear um, you know visibility of collections of tolls uh, and we are senior secured in each of these projects uh, we completely control the escrows the possibility on any loss given default finally is nil and as you know under indes where we have moved the provision to be taken or the expected credit losses are probability of default into loss given default so if loss given default is zero the question of taking uh, provisions does not arise so to state very simply and you know take out these technicalities we believe that the order doesn't stop regular repayments but in any case and we have taken lots of legal opinion uh, including a supreme court uh, uh, cji uh, uh, past cji uh, but even considering that let's say uh, and there is a clarification expected on 28th even in case that goes against this for example uh, the loss given default we expect to be nil because of the intrinsic strength of the projects we believe that all those projects are equity positive which will be good for the projects good for us and good for ilfs and uh, the equity holders of ilfs at the at the end of it so we believe that yes you are right atmosphere a bit murky now but uh, clarity should emerge very soon okay lastly what kind of growth numbers can one expect from you in quarter four? You mentioned it will be a lot more benign. Can you put some numbers out there? Uh, I, I, I would quarter four should largely be on the line of quarter three, uh, except for say the rural business. So generally speaking, rural business maximum uh, disbursement is always in Q3. Uh, simple because this time Dashera and Diwali both came in Q3. So uh, obviously it's the festive season and maximum uh, disbursements happen. So Q4 disbursements will definitely be lower than Q3 because there is no festival in Q4. But uh, year on year. Uh, the good growth should continue uh, after that I don't want to give any short term guidance it's an enigmatic year uh, there is elections happening we don't know how rainfall is going to be too early to talk about short term guidances but uh, the the growth number of CAGR of five years of 18 to 20 percent and uh, top quartile ROE is is the guidance we give and we are confident of maintaining that over a medium three to uh, three to five years medium term period Okay, Mr. Dubashi, we'll leave it at that and congratulations on a good quarter uh, and we look forward to talking to you once again post your quarter four numbers which LNT itself believes will be a good set of numbers. Uh, the market's not looking all that great though, about uh, 43 odd points off for the Nifty, 137 off for the Sensex, so it's not the prettiest of pictures. Sun Pharma and Kotak Bank are helping hold the index higher but autos have taken a bit of a nose dive today. Mahindra and Mahindra, Maruti Suzuki, Tata Motors, that list looks painful. Ashok Leyland at 88 must be trading at some few month lows as well. So it's not looking all that great at the broader end of the spectrum. We've already highlighted stocks like of Prabhat Dairy and a few others which seem to be really rocking the charts. Sun Pharma Advanced Research as well is doing rather well for itself. But wrap it up on this leg of Indian Open from Devina and me and the team that put this show together. Thank you so much for watching. The FNO Show takes over the action on the other side.